turn to uh, Joel chapter 2, verse 28. Joel chapter 2, verse 28 is, of course, one of the hallmark and most popular uh, passages related to the day of Pentecost. And this is the day of Pentecost, for those who don't know. This is the day of Pentecost when we celebrate the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and we celebrate the church being born and we celebrate what God gave birth to. In Joel chapter 2, verse 28, Joel chapter 2, verse 28, the Lord says, It will come about after this, and I will explain after this in a minute, but it will come about after this that I will pour out my spirit on all mankind. And your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on the male and the female servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. I will display wonders in the sky. Notice the continuation of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit moving into the day of the Lord without a break. Notice that? I will display wonders in the sky and on the earth, blood, fire, and columns of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. That's the sixth seal in the book of Revelation, when the sixth seal is broken. And in that time, the time of Jacob's trouble, the last three and a half years of the age, it will come about that whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be delivered. For on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, there will be those who escape. As the Lord has said, even among the survivors whom the Lord calls. Here's the picture we've got here. Is some people say, well, that was, that was completely fulfilled in the first century on the day of Pentecost. When Peter stood up, and even what we celebrate today, when Peter stood up and said, Men, these men, the people who are people of Israel, these men are not drunk as you suppose. It's only the morning. But this is to fulfill what Joel said that the Spirit of the Lord would be poured out. Now, I would argue that that first outpouring of the Holy Spirit was the very initial deposit. But there's coming a last end time final outpouring of the Holy Spirit that we have not yet seen. Well, how do I know that? How do, how do I know that with confidence? I know it because verse 28 opens up and it says very clearly, it will come about after this. After what? After what we have been talking about the past few weeks. After an, an, an army of intercessors cry out in prayer for the nation of Israel. And they cry out in intercession. Five million intercessors in this hour are praying for Israel. We are bringing this to the, the last day. Crying out for the nation of Israel. Spare your people. And do not make your inheritance a reproach that the nation should rule over them. And God says... After they, they prayer, after they pray like that, God says, then it will come about that I will be zealous for my land and I will have pity on my people. And then he continues to go on until verse 28 and he says, it will come about after this. It will come about after this, after what? After verse 20, when God destroys an invading army that comes in from the north. And as I've been talking about the last two Sundays, I believe that army is a Russian-led Islamic army that's coming into the nation of Israel that is God's plan for that nation. God is the one ultimately behind this because he's going to use it to bring about his ultimate purposes. This Russian Islamic army is coming into the nation of Israel, Russia being led by money and finances, the Islamic army, Iran and Turkey being led to bring and to recapture Allah for Jerusalem. And I, our, and I spent about an hour, and, and hopefully you listened to the message I did on Tuesday, I spent an hour explaining why I believe with all my heart, I'm not dogmatic, but I believe confidently, not dogmatically. If someone can prove it otherwise, I'll change my position. I want the truth. I don't want just my position. But I believe confidently that this timing of this event is before Daniel's 70th week. 
The last seven years, what some have called the tribulation, when the Antichrist signs a covenant with the nation of Israel for, for seven years. I believe for, for several reasons, and I, 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 again, I spent a whole hour going through that on Tuesday with extensive notes. I would encourage you, if you didn't see that, to check that out. It is one of the most, if not the most, important uh, prophecies to understand at the end of the age is when does Ezekiel 38 and 39 take place? Answering that question of when is vital. That's why I spent an hour or more going through that. It's a, it's a debated uh, question. I'm not going to go into that debate now because I want to focus on, uh, on this last great outpouring of the Holy Spirit. See, as we celebrate Pentecost today, as we celebrate the first outpouring of the Holy Spirit, not only do we celebrate the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that came 2,000 years ago, but we anticipate there is coming a last day's outpouring of the Holy Spirit that's going to surpass the book of Acts. And many of us, I hope I'm alive, many of us are going to be alive to witness this. It is going to be incredible. In the midst of tribulation, in the midst of testing, in the midst of the, the worst darkness in human history, there is coming an outpouring of the Holy Spirit like you have never seen. The last day's outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the latter rain outpouring of the Holy Spirit, but I want you to catch this, it is connected, wholly connected to God's chosen servant Israel and what God does in the Jewish nation. And I'll show it to you in this, in this message. So as we celebrate Pentecost and we thank God, thank you, Lord, for the first outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And as we say, God, do it again in our day today, not just in the future, whenever that future is. Do it in us today. Revive us, O Lord. Stir us up in the Spirit. Stir up the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Stir up the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Stir up all, the, all that you want to do that we might be those witnesses. How desperately the church needs to be a witness today in this culture that is depraved, that has gone off the deep end. How desperately we need a, a Spirit-empowered witness that boldly declares the truth of God's Word in this day and hour. How badly we need a church empowered with the spirit and the power of Elijah to confront the darkness that's rising up. As they try to groom our kids into gross sexual perversion, we need to be a voice, an Elijah voice that says, the buck stops here. That is not going to happen on our watch. We need that power to be that witness. See, we kind of have this idea of the end times being like, we're just going to go hide away in the corner and wait to be raptured by Jesus and just as evil takes over this world. And I believe Scripture paints a very different picture. No, it is Elijah confronting Baal. It is the prophets of God confronting Baal. It is God rising up in the spirit and the power of Elijah in his church as a bold witness of confrontation against the evil that is pervading in this land. Not on our watch. We need another infusion of the Holy Spirit's power on this day of Pentecost. We need it now. We don't have to just wait till Israel is invaded for that to happen. But I'm telling you, that event is coming. So not only do we celebrate what's happened in the past, not only do we say, Lord, do it right now in our day, but we also say there is a prophetic moment that's coming in the nation of Israel. When God delivers Israel from Gog... And this invading Russian Islamic army, God decimates that army on the mountains of Israel. And in that day when that happens, on the very day when Gog comes into the nation of Israel, God says, on that very day my fury will mount up in my anger and there will be an earthquake that will rupture and erupt out of this land. It will not be your typical earthquake caused by a fault line. It will be an earthquake of God's manifest presence coming to the earth with Israel being the epicenter of the very of the very epicenter of the manifest presence of God that's coming. We're living in the days of God's presence. We've never seen anything like this before. We've never experienced anything like this before. We've got to be ready, we've got to be ready church, for what's coming. We have never experienced what is coming. It is coming. 
And if you're young, you need to get on board because you are going to be at the very forefront of this move of God like has never been seen. The prophets long to look into this moment you are living in. I'm encouraging you if you're young. That's not dad. That's not, uh, just kidding. If you're young, I'm, I'm not young either, so it's, uh, hopefully I'll be at the tail end of this. But if you're young, this is coming into your day and, a, your day and hour. You need to be ready. Amen. It's going to shake the foundations of this earth once again with Holy Spirit power and a display of God's power the world has never seen, even greater than the days of Jesus, even greater than the days of the apostles. Jesus said, greater works than these will you do because I go to the Father. We have not seen anything yet. There is coming that we are living in the days of God's manifest presence. We're only at the very, 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 very beginning of that. But I'm telling you, it's coming. There is coming a move of the Holy Spirit like you've never seen. And it, it is seen in the book of Joel. It is seen in Ezekiel 38 and 39. It will come about after this that I will pour out my spirit after God defeats this invading northern army, that this Islamic Russian alliance that comes in to recapture Jerusalem for Allah. After this happens, God says, I will pour out my spirit. Praise God, the day we live in. We need to wake up because we are living in the most prophetic hour in human history. Do you realize how many prophecies there are about the second coming of Jesus Christ? And we are living in the time of prophetic fulfillment. We are living in that hour. The prophets, the people of God have longed to see for hundreds and thousands of years you, me, we are living in that time of prophetic fulfillment. What an hour to be alive. Don't allow yourself to be caught up in the culture that is so against Jesus Christ. God is on the move. Amen. I'm glad you're so excited. All right. You guys are celebrating Memorial Day before me. All right. The last great outpouring of the Holy Spirit. What an incredible time. Terry Bennett said, quoting Leonard Ravenhill, there is coming a Pentecost that will out Pentecost, Pentecost. It's going to lead to a massive revival. It's going to lead to an incredible harvest that we can't even fathom. It's going to lead to the bride being made ready a bridal revival, the, last, the, the latter rain outpouring of the Holy Spirit is going to bring maturity to the church. It's not just going to bring a massive number of people into the church. It's going to bring a massive number of people to full maturity. The Lord's going to do that. That's what the latter rain did in the harvest season. That's what the latter rain is going to do in these end times. God is going to move and he's going to bring up the, son, the children of God in their immaturity, the church in their immaturity, and he's going to cause the spirit is going to rise up within them and they are going to be the mature sons of God. They are going to be those who have come into the full measure of the stature of Jesus Christ. What an hour we live in. What an hour, what an hour. Just for the sake of time, I'm not going to review what I did in any of the message. I'm going, to, I'm going to jump right into what I believe is going to happen and what I believe the scripture teaches about what's going to happen in the aftermath of Gog and Magog. When God rises up, when God defeats Gog and Magog and that army in Ezekiel 38 and 39, what happens in the aftermath of that? That's kind of the focus I want to focus on here. What I want to start with, though, is the ultimate, God's ultimate goal in this is to bring glory and honor to himself. He's not doing this because Israel has a special bloodline. He is not doing this because Israel is God's favorite son. God is about to act for his namesake. God is about to act for his glory. Notice what Ezekiel said in Ezekiel 38, verse 23, what Ezekiel prophesied. He said, the Lord says, on when this event happens, the Lord says, I will magnify myself. I will sanctify myself. 
I will make myself known in the sight of many nations. Listen, and they will know that I am the Lord. Can you imagine what that's going to be like? When this army comes in and hopeless and helpless Israel looks like they're about to be decimated. And God says, I'm going to magnify myself. I'm going to sanctify myself. And I'm going to make myself known in the sight of many nations. When God says, I'm going to magnify myself, he's talking about he's going to show the entire world his greatness. He's going to unveil to the world his greatness. He's going to show the world his greatness. This is the greatness of who I am. To an atheistic, humanistic world that wonders, is there really a God? To a world that's enmeshed in false religion and even the cultural ideology that's going on in our nation. The whole LGBTQ agenda that's being pushed on children. Is there really a God? The Lord is about to magnify himself in the sight of all nations and show them I am God. God is not dead. He is alive. And like the song says, he's roaring like a lion from Zion. And when you touch the apple of God's eye, you touch God's heart. And there are serious consequences for it. God is going to magnify himself in the sight of a humanistic world. Is there a God? Is there really a God? Is God even real? God's about to show the earth how great he is. And the nations, their mouths are going to drop when God displays his might to the world. The Lord says in Ezekiel 39, 21, I will set my glory among the nations and the idea is he's going to set his glory among the nations through this judgment. And all the nations will see this judgment which I have executed in my hand, which I have laid on them. God's going to show his glory. God's going to glorify himself in the sight of many nations. Sanctify himself. When the Lord says, I'm going to sanctify myself, what that means is God is going to set himself apart from every other idol from every other mindset, from every, every other philosophy. God is going to set himself from, apart from every other religion. The Marxists and the communists and the globalists are going to see the display of God's power in the nation of Israel, and they're going to tremble. Islam is going to come against this nation, trying to capture Jerusalem for Allah, and God is going to show the Muslim world he is the most high God over all the earth. I'm telling you, he's going to sanctify himself. He's going to set himself apart to a, to a world that does not believe, to an atheistic communist nation. Well, not really communist anymore, but used to be still the mindset carried over. He's going to show himself to the Russian people, I am the Lord. He's going to show himself to Iran, to Turkey, I am the Lord and there is no other. He's going to show himself to the nations. I am the Lord and there is no other. And the nations are going to stand in awe as they see the God of Israel show himself like he did in the days of Elijah. When Elijah confronted the prophets of Baal, we're headed to another showdown uh, like Mount Carmel when Elijah showed up and said, where is your God? And they could not display any firepower and God sends fire down from heaven. We're entering into that day before the Lord comes. For the Lord's glory. And then when he does that, he says he's going to make himself known. He's going to make himself known. Not only is he going to display his power, because if all he did was display his power, the nations would be, okay, who is this God? Is he the God of Judaism? He's not the God of, I mean, ultimately, he's the Jewish people. God has moved from Judaism to the new covenant. He's going to show the world. When he says, I'm going to make myself known, what it means, he's going to reveal to the nations that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He's going to unveil his face to the nations. And the nations are going to see that Yeshua, Jesus, is Messiah. 
It's going to ripple throughout Israel. It's going to ripple. Now, I don't believe every single Jewish person is going to be saved. I'll talk about that later. But it's going to ripple throughout the, the Middle East, ripple throughout the nations. He's going to make himself known. He's going to show the, the world who he truly is. And there's coming a revelation and un, an unveiling of Jesus Christ, I believe, in the greatest harvest we have ever seen. What a time to be alive. Okay, if you think I'm exaggerating, just read my notes. <laughs> I feel like I made a good case. All right, so as I can read some of your thoughts, like, is this really true? Uh, read these notes and pray about it, seriously. Well, let me show this slide that the slide after God decimates this Russian Islamic army. And again, even though I'm passionate about this, I'm not dogmatic, all right? So sometimes my passion can come across as dog dogmatism. If I can be proven wrong, I will repent. I don't want to teach anything that's not true. So the slide here, what I want to talk about in this message and probably uh, in another message here is what happens after God decimates the Russian Islamic army. As you see on the far left, you see prayer. That's where we are right now. And you see at some point after this, God will defeat this Russian Islamic army. And, and number one is you have these, what I call pre-tribulation events. It's the events that happened before Daniel's 70th week. Then you have peace treaty. That's Daniel 9, 24 through, that's Daniel 9, 27, when the Antichrist makes a covenant with Israel for a week. That, that lasts for about three and a half years where there's peace and safety. And the last three and a half years are what's called the great tribulation. So you have number one, number two, number three. Number one, pre-tribulation events. Number two, uh, tribulation, first half of the tribulation events. And then number three, you have the great tribulation events. And as you see, I've got here that during this whole time, the Holy Spirit has been poured out, and I believe intensifying in his presence. Make sense? Okay. So let's talk about in this message some pre-tribulation events. What happens in the aftermath of God judging Gog and Magog? Number one is the Lord says, I will vindicate my holy name. Here's what I want you to get. God is jealous for his holy name. It's the jealousy of God. It's the jealousy of God that's moving him in this time to act. He says in Ezekiel 39, verse 7, My holy name I will make known in the midst of my people Israel, and I will not let my holy name be profaned anymore by them, is the idea, and the nations will know that I am the Lord, the Holy One in Israel. See, God told Israel in Isaiah chapter 49, or Isaiah chapter 43, You are my witnesses. You are my chosen servant. But Israel failed. Israel failed. By her many transgressions, Israel failed. Ultimately, by rejecting God's beloved son, Jesus Christ, that was the ultimate failure of Israel. And God drove them out of the land in 70 A.D. and 135 A.D. God drove them out of the land by the Romans and sent them into a 2,000 or so year exile, a little bit less, into the nations. And that nation became just absolutely nothing. It just was a wasteland. And God began to move in the early 1900s to restore Israel. And God began to move in 19, after World War II, after the Holocaust, when the UN voted 33 to 13 to make Israel a nation in 1947, God began to move on May 14, 1948, when Israel was reborn officially and it fulfilled the prophet Isaiah when he said, Who has heard of such a thing? Can a nation be born in one day? What a prophetic hour. What a prophetic time we are living in. Yet Israel failed. Israel failed. Because they did not give witness to what they were supposed to be in this land. Notice what Ezekiel 36 verse 21, 36 verse 20 says. This is, what, this is what God says about Israel when they failed. He says, when they came to the nations where they went, they, this is after 
135 A.D., when the Romans drove the, the Jewish people out of the land, and they were out of the land for almost 2,000 years. This is what the Lord says. When they came to the nations where they went, they profaned my holy name. Why did they profane this holy name? This is, what, this is what God says. Because it was said of them, these are the people of the Lord, yet they have come out of his land. Israel profaned God's name because they were meant to be in that land. Yet they came out because God drove them out. Because of their multiplied transgressions, God drove them out. But here's where we're getting at. God, this is what he says, but I had concern for my holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the nations where they went. See, you get this picture that God is moving. God is about to act not because of anything else. Well, there's other reasons, but at the top of this purpose, God's top purpose is for his holy name. He's jealous for his holy name. And having the, the, the Jewish people dwelling in the land of Israel is what glorifies God. Okay, so how then is the Lord going to redeem his name? How is the Lord going to redeem his name? Number one, he's going to restore them to their own land, which we are witnessing. He's also regathered them back. Over six million Jews have come back in the last 75 years. Number three, as I've been talking about over the last two or three weeks or four weeks, God is going to decimate a Russian Islamic army on the mountains of Israel. Number four, is this is going, this is where we're getting at now, is this is going to lead many people to saving faith in Jesus Christ. Many Jewish people to saving faith in Jesus Christ. We see in Ezekiel 36, 25 through 27, that God says, I'm going to, I'm going to bring them back into their own land. I'm going to gather them from the nations into their own land. Then God says very clearly, then, then I will, I will sprinkle clean water on them and they will be clean. Then I will bring them into the new covenant. See, God is sending the Jewish people back to the nation of Israel for the purpose of bringing them to salvation. I don't believe that means every single Jewish person is going to get saved. I believe many are still going to reject them. But what we're seeing is God is no longer going to hide his face from them. Right now, Israel, the, the majority of Israel, even if they wanted to, cannot come to saving faith in Jesus Christ because God has judicially hardened them. He has blinded them. It talks about this in Romans 11. He has given them a spirit of stupor to bring in the fullness of the Gentiles. But that fullness of the Gentiles is now coming to an end, and God's bringing them to that place of acceptance and that place of salvation. And when that happens, it will bring life from the dead. That's how God is glorifying his great name. Number two, the Lord says in the, in the aftermath of this attack, the Lord says, I am going to judge the nations who attack Israel. He says in 39 verse 6, he says, And I will send fire upon Magog and those who inhabit the coastlands in safety. And they will know that I am the Lord. See, what happens is you touch the apple of God's eye, God touches you. You curse God's chosen people, God's chosen land, his land, God, his curse comes on you. So the, the leading army, this Magog army, which I said I think is probably Russia, when they come against that land, God then sends fire upon that land, upon those who dwell in the coastlands in safety. I don't believe it's a wrath or a destructive judgment in the sense that, that there's no hope. I believe God is doing this to say, you better repent and put your faith in Jesus. It is a redemptive judgment that's going to come into the nation of Russia to, bring open to, the, to open up the gospel to many, many people in that nation. And even though it doesn't say in Ezekiel 38 and 39 that this same thing would happen to Turkey and Iran and Libya and Sudan. But I believe you could look at other scriptures that, that show if you touch God's nation, you, if you touch this nation, judgment comes on you. So I think you can safely say all of the nations that attack 
in their territory. God's going to send judgment, and that judgment is going to ultimately bring open a massive door for the gospel of Jesus Christ to go forth unhindered. Number three, after the, in the aftermath of this attack, the Lord says, I will accept Israel once again. Ezekiel 39, 29, the Lord says, I will not hide my face from them any longer. Do you know what the face of God is or who the face of God is? It's Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 talks about the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. When God says, I will not hide my face from them any longer, what he's saying is, I will no longer hide them from seeing Jesus Christ as Messiah. That means then, that is the day of Israel's acceptance. And Paul said when Israel is accepted again, it's going to bring life from the dead. And, and we're going to see Israel become that valley of dry bones where the Spirit of God breathes life into them and they come alive in their land and become that exceedingly great army that Ezekiel prophesied. See, when, when, when this army comes in and God rises up and God decimates this army, God says, I will not hide my face from them anymore. I will show them my face and my face, the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ his face is Jesus Christ. Jesus is the face of God. This means he's then going to reveal Jesus Christ to the Jewish people. But just because God is now revealing Jesus Christ to the Jewish people, that, I don't believe that means every single Jewish person is going to accept him. They still have a free will. They still have a free choice. I, don't, I believe a number of them are going to continue in, messy, in, not, in Orthodox Judaism. They're going to ultimately build the third temple, which is going to be a disgrace to the eyes of God. You can read about it in Isaiah chapter 66. And that's going to be to their demise. But I believe in the many... I, I, there was a survey done in 2015 in the, in, related to Israel asking how many Jewish people in the land of Israel are religious. 65% of the nation said... They were, they were non-religious. They were either atheists or secular, 65%. That's, the, that's where the revival, I believe, is going to hit. 30% of religious, either being orthodox or ultra-orthodox. Most of those probably are going to continue in, that, in Judaism and build the third temple. But in that 65% of secular Jewish people, when they, when they look up and they see, they see God do what he just did in their land, they're going to be like, whoa, who is this God? And they're like, I don't really want to do that and look at the Orthodox Jewish you know, system. But there's going to be voices raised up in Israel that's going to say, Jesus is your Messiah. And there's going to be a revival in Israel. There's, and I believe it's going to be that secular, that 65% that's going to come into a saving faith in Jesus Christ. God says in that verse, Israel will know that I am the Lord their God from that day onward. That day, I believe, will be the beginning of all Israel being saved. Now, that's a multi-year process. I don't know how many years, five, ten, I have no idea. It's a multi-year process. On that day, God says, Israel will know that I am the Lord their God. And that is the beginning of a multi-year process that leads the Jewish people to salvation, at least a significant remnant, that then leads them to become a bride made ready in the fire of the great tribulation. When God says in Zechariah chapter 13, I will cut off two-thirds of the land, but I will bring one-third of the land through the fire, and they will be my God, and, and I will... Be, sorry, I re re messed that up. I will be their God, and they will be my people. <clears throat> Number four, Israel will be the epicenter 
of the Lord's manifest presence in the earth. Israel will be the, the epicenter of the manifest presence in the earth. I heard someone recently say, you know, you've heard that saying that says, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. This guy was saying, what happens in Israel does not stay in Israel. What, this, what happens in this event is not going to remain in the nation of Israel. It's going to ripple outward from the nations in the manifest presence of God. See, I think we need to get a new view of the end times. It's not just dark, gloomy, and depressing, and sad, and terrible. Yes, that's part of it. The end times are the best of times and the worst of times at the same time. Some people only focus on the darkness and the gloom. Some people only focus on the joy and the outpouring of the Spirit. There's both. We need, we need to understand the Scriptures have clearly shown us there's both at the end of the age. There is the best of times and the worst of times at the same time. And so there is, going, there is coming in, we are coming into the days of God's presence, unlike anything we have ever seen. Notice what Ezekiel 38 verse 18 says. On this very day, this, nation, this alliance attacks. Listen to what God says. Let me actually read verse 17. Ezekiel 38, verse 17. Let me pull it up here on my, my Bible. Give me one second. Ezekiel 38. No, verse 18. Verse 18. It will come about on that day. What day? When Gog comes against the land of Israel. In other words, that's why you could say this is a one-day war. Or, as Mark Hitchcock has said, a prophecy scholar, it's a one-hour war. On the very day that Gog comes against the land of Israel, on that very day, declares the Lord, my fury will mount up in my anger. In my zeal and in my blazing wrath, I declare that on that day there will surely be an earth, a great earthquake in the land of Israel. The fish of the sea, the birds of the heavens, the beasts of the field, all the creeping things that creep on the face of the earth, or all the men who are on the face of the earth, listen to what it says. They're not shaking from the earthquake. They're shaking from his presence. The manifest presence of God coming in in this event, rippling from Israel as the epicenter, cascading through the nations. The nations are going to shake at the manifest presence of God. I don't believe this is the second coming. I argued for that in the last message. This is, the, this is when the days of his presence go to an entirely new level. The manifest presence of God coming in to the nation of Israel, rising up as Israel's defense, the manifest presence of God rippling from that nation, cascading through the nations. The nations shake at the presence of God. You, you think the upper room shook in the first century when the Holy Spirit came to 120 people. Just imagine what the second upper room experience is going to be when he shakes not just the upper room in Jerusalem. He shakes the entire earth with his manifest presence and his glory. The days of God's presence. Man, what a time to be alive. Some have said this earthquake is caused by a fault line. The only fault line is caused is by the ones who, have, who are at fault for coming against God's land. And the only thing causing this is God's presence. This is caused by God's presence.
I did a message a few, I don't know, a few months ago, Matthew 24, verse 37, where the coming of the Son of Man is just like the days of Noah. It's not just one day, it's days. The days of Noah are a 120-year period. And I, I said in that message that the, the word coming is the word parousia, which means presence. And I said that the, the coming of the Lord is not just his second coming, but it's a multi-year process of the days of God's presence that ultimately leads to Jesus Christ returning to the earth in blazing fire with his holy angels. But the days leading up to the second coming are not just going to be like ho hum. We're hiding in the corner, waiting for the antichrist, or waiting for Jesus Christ to rescue us from the antichrist. No, the days leading up to his coming are the days of God's presence. We have yet to see one, Psalms one ten fulfilled the day of God's power when God's army volunteers freely in the day of His power. Yet we are moving into that day, the days of God's presence. And I believe this event, Ezekiel 38 and 39, is a catalyst that triggers and takes this, the presence of God to an entirely different level that we have never seen before. The days of His presence. See, we're living in days of glory. We're living in the time when the manifest presence of God is coming to this earth. Isaiah 60, Arise, shine, for your light has come, for the glory of God has risen upon you. Deep darkness is going to cover the people. We're seeing that. And, and, and who knows where it's going to go. I don't really want to think about it. But I want to tell you, deep darkness, though it covers the earth, there is coming upon God's people a glory and a manifest presence of God like we have never seen. There is coming and rising up within God's people the morning star that the, the people of God who overcome are going to be bright morning stars that shine into the nations and point to the second coming of Christ just like the first star over Bethlehem pointed to Christ. There's going to be overcomers who shine forth the glory of God as the morning star saying he's coming again. They're going to shine in the darkest hour in human history and you are called to be that. I am called to be that. Number five, in the aftermath of this event, God is going to pour out his spirit upon the nations like never before. We've already talked about this a lot that the the, uh, where, where Joel said it will come about after this, Pentecost was the early rain. This, what I'm describing, is the latter rain. It's the latter rain outpouring of the Holy Spirit. I don't mean it's the latter rain revival that took place after World War II. It is the latter rain outpouring of the Holy Spirit that will bring the harvest to maturity. The early rain brought growth and like we see in the first century, it brought growth. The latter rain is going to bring maturity. That's why I believe this final outpouring of the Holy Spirit is not just going to bring a, number of, a massive number of people into salvation. It's going to make the bride ready. This outpouring of the Holy Spirit is a bridal revival. It is a bridal revival that's going to make the bride ready. It's going to bring the maturity of the sons of God into that full measure of the stature of Jesus Christ. See, Pentecost was only a down payment of what's coming. And I believe, too, right now, the prophetic movement in much of the church has egg on its face. All the failed Trump prophecies from 2020, <laughs> you know, it's like you get to the point where you're like, okay, Lord, is anyone even speaking the word of the Lord in the church today? You know, I'm, there are, there's a few. But I'm telling you, when the Spirit of God is poured out, like we see in, in Joel chapter 2, the prophetic movement is going to be recovered, and God is going to have a pure prophetic movement at the end of the age, a company of prophetic witnesses that will prophesy in the day of God's power with prophecy, signs, wonders, dreams, and visions. 
God is going to end this age with a prophetic witness in his church that is not mired by soulish mixture or humanistic, selfish purposes. God's going to have a prophetic army, an Elijah army who prophesies the true word of the Lord. You're not going to have to just wonder, okay, you get this, I won't say the email, you get this email that comes out every day and God's speaking all this stuff every day, yet he contradicts, one person says he's doing this, the other person totally contradicts what he's saying here, this person then just contradicts that other person and it's like, what? This is like God's a schizophrenic. God, the, we are not going to have this mixture of the prophetic where we're wondering, Lord, what are you really saying? When this happens, God is going to have a prophetic witness in his church that's going to be undiluted and undefiled by soulish mixture. And you're called to be one of those prophetic voices, one of those prophetic ministers who ministers in the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Number six. The good news is, this is my last point. The bad news is it's long. The Lord will release the greatest revival in history in Israel and in the nations after this event. I just want us to, if you, if you have your Bibles, just kind of flip, with the, flip through these with me or you can show them on the screen. Ezekiel 38 verse 23. God says, I will magnify myself. I will sanctify myself. I will make myself known in the sight of many nations. Listen, and they will know that I am the Lord. The nations are going to know he is the Lord. 39.6, I will send fire upon Magog and those who inhabit the coastlands in safety. And they will know that I am the Lord. 39.7, my holy, name I will not, I will, my holy name I will make known in the midst of my people Israel. I will not let my holy name be profaned anymore. And the nations will know that I am the Lord. You see a recurring theme? 39.22. And the house of Israel will know that I am the Lord, their God, from that day onward. Ezekiel 39.28. Then they will know that I am the Lord because I made them go into the exile among the nations and gather them again to their own land. I will leave none of them there any longer. Three times, three times, I can't count. Three times, I failed that with uh, child raising. Sorry, Anna. Three times, three times God says, the nations will know that I am the Lord after this event. Two times God says, Israel will know that I am the Lord after this event. See, God doesn't say to the Jewish people, come back. See, this is a mentality that I think is out there in the body of Christ. Come back. He's saying to the Jewish people, come back to the land of Israel. Yeah, you survived the Holocaust, but come back. And he doesn't tell them that you're going to die at the hand of the Antichrist. Is the Antichrist coming? Yes. But God says, come back to the land of Israel and be saved. God's not calling them back to the land of Israel just to, just to die. He's calling them back to the Israel to have an opportunity to be saved. We, we need to change this paradigm that's been out there. Like, no, they're just coming back and it's just going to be like, there is trouble coming to Israel. Absolutely, there's, there is great trouble coming to Israel, but there's also coming a season of revival. God wants to bring the Jewish people back from the nations, back into the land of Israel, he, because God's heart is he wants to save them. He says, I'm going to no longer hide my face from the house of Israel because he wants them to be saved. Again, not all will. They still have a choice. It's not this like Calvinistic thing where God overrides their free will. No, God says, I'm going to give you a choice. That's the heart of God in this. Think about this. Some of, you, some of you have never thought about this, but think about this. The correlation between what God does in Israel and how God releases revival. In the early 1900s, a movement began called Zionism, 
which sought to establish a national homeland for the Jewish people. At the very same time, God released a Pentecostal movement in Topeka, Kansas, and also in Los Angeles, California, the Azusa Street Revival. See, that is the beginning of the, of the modern-day Pentecostal charismatic movement. Is what God did in reforming the nation of Israel, God was also doing as it relates to revival in the nations. At the same time, also in 1904, you've heard of the Welsh Revival, where a revival broke out in Wales, England, and spread to the nations. See, I, I think there's a correlation between what God was doing in Israel and what God is doing in revival to revive the church and to bring about the church into the fullness. Think about this. In the late 1940s to, to the 60s, God established the nation of Israel. The UN voted uh, 33 to 13 in 1947 to make Israel a nation. Israel became a nation on May 14, 1948. At the same time, there is what is called the latter rain revival of the 50s and 60s. And that revival, though there was a lot of issues, okay, there was a lot of issues in that revival, God was still moving in that revival. There was a massive revival with healing, prophecy, the restoration of the fivefold ministry. There was a, 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 a great revival that broke out in the latter rain revival. 1967 to 1973, what happens? June 5th, 1967, the Six-Day War begins. Israel recaptures Jerusalem at the end of that war, their beloved city. Do you know what happens? 1967, the Summer of Love breaks out in San Francisco. In June, you've seen the movie, Jesus Revolution, which that led to what uh, some scholars believe that's one of the greatest, that should be classified as a great awakening in our history. If you haven't seen the movie Jesus Revolution, go see it. It's an incredible movie. Do you see the correlation between God capturing Jerusalem in 19, or the Jewish people capturing Jerusalem in 1967, and this great, this is probably the last great revival America's had in 1967, the Jesus Revolution. Think about this. Dave, King David, thousands of years ago, captured Jerusalem, and he set, up, he set up in Jerusalem on Mount Zion. He set up 24 hour a day, seven day a week worship. He took the Ark of the Covenant from the Tabernacle of Moses, brought it to Jerusalem and Mount Zion, set up worshipers who worshiped 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And now, many of the Psalms you read were written in the Tabernacle of David as worshipers worship God day and night before his throne before the Ark of the Covenant. Many Psalms were written in that tabernacle of David as they beheld the glory of God in that open place, seeing that, the glory there with incredible worship. Think about this. 1967, Israel recaptures Jerusalem for the first time in almost 2,000 years. The Jesus movement kicks off. And you know what the Jesus movement is famous for? The modern-day worship movement. If it wasn't for the Jesus movement, we would have been singing old choruses this morning. If it wasn't for the Jesus movement, we would not have the modern-day worship movement. Now, the modern-day worship movement, there's a lot of issues with that as well. But it started out, and I believe there's still a remnant in it that's pure, but it started out so incredible. See, there is a connection between what God does in Israel and what God does in the nations. And so, when God defeats this army, you better believe it. God is going to release the greatest outpouring of the Spirit we've ever seen. When God, when Israel is accepted again, God says that there is going to come life from the dead. There is going to come life from the dead. Israel is God's chosen servant. So I want to end this message by giving you a few things to watch for. Because in all that I said, and all that I said, even if you would say, okay, I'm not sure if that's right, that's fine, as long as you study it. I'm not sure, there's other people that say something different, I'm not sure if that's correct. As long as you study it, that's fine. We don't have to agree on this, but I would at least encourage you, if you think what I'm saying is over-exaggerated, I would at least encourage you to watch for these things, all right? Number one, watch for this, this current crisis that's going on in Iran to somehow work 
to lead Israel to dwelling more securely in the land, to fulfill that condition for Ezekiel 38 and 39. Just watch for that. I don't know how or how that's going to happen. I have no idea. But I believe that could potentially happen. See, if you think about it, the Arab-Israeli war that took, began in 1948, many of the Israeli leaders say the, Arab, the Arab-Israeli war is now over. That war has led to Israel dwelling more securely in their land. I believe we're going to see that same type of thing with Iran. I have no idea how that's going to happen. But just watch for it. I could be wrong. But, but just watch for that. And we'll pray into that as well. Watch for a Russian Islamic invasion into Israel when America has been weakened. You may not want to hear that last part, but I think for that prophecy to be fulfilled, America has to be weakened, in my opinion. I could be wrong. But watch for that invasion happening as America gets weaker. Number three, The greatest outpouring of the Spirit, the greatest revival. Watch for the greatest outpouring of the Spirit, the greatest revival, the greatest harvest in history. Listen, I could be wrong about the timing of this. God, time will tell. God's God's view is right, not my view. If I have God's view, then I'm right. If I don't have God's view, I'm not right. But watch for these things. But here's here's why I want to end this, is the church... Our church, the church, there is about to be the greatest harvest in human history that's going to stretch and test the church like never before. The church has to be ready and prepared, not just for trouble and difficulty. We need to be ready for that. Okay, we need to be prepared for the trials that are coming. But we also need to be ready for this revival and this harvest that's coming. Right now, if this harvest came in, I believe the church is so divided that our nets, that the nets we bring in to bring in these fish would break because the nets are not mended. God, would you bring unity into your church so that we can work together in the global church to bring in this harvest? Even as it relates to us as a forerunner ministry, we need to, I feel that this is a burden for us, we need to be prepared as a forerunner ministry because God's ultimate intention is not just to bring people to salvation. His ultimate intention is to make the bride ready. And we need to be ready. You need to be ready. You need to be equipped, okay? Okay. This is why it's so important you get equipped right now. Don't wait. Equipping takes a long time. You need to be equipped. You need to be trained as a forerunner because the greatest harvest in history is coming. Let me read Amos chapter 9. Especially the, I keep talking about the young people. Maybe I'm jealous because you're young and I'm old. So maybe that's what's coming out here. But no, it's... The burden on my heart is it takes time. It takes time to get equipped. It takes time to get trained. But Amos chapter 9, verse 13. We're moving into this day and hour. I believe this prophecy is related to Ezekiel 38 and 39. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord. Just receive this right now, especially if you're younger. Even, I'm not trying to exclude the older people. I want to be in this too, but especially the younger people. You'll be living right at the forefront of this, pioneering it, leading it. Days are coming, declares the Lord, when the plowman will overtake the reaper. In other words, the one reaping the harvest is going to have to be reaping so much of the harvest, the plowman who's getting ready for the next season overtakes him because the, the reaper can't bring in the, the, all the harvest that's coming in. That's the harvest that's coming in soon. The treader of grapes, him who sows seeds. When the mountains will drip with sweet wine and the hills will be dissolved. Uh, listen to this. I want you to see the connection between that harvest and Israel. Also, I will restore the captivity of my people Israel. I will rebuild the ruined cities and live in them. They will also plant vineyards and drink their wine and make gardens and eat their fruit. 
I will also plant them on their own land, listen, and they will not again be rooted out from their land, which I have given them, says the Lord God. The Antichrist is not going to drive Israel out of its land. Yes, there's going to be half the city that's going to be exiled. Yes, there's going to be a war that he leaves, is that two-thirds perish. But Israel is never, ever going to be uprooted from their land again. And it's in that context, the days that we live in, I believe Ezekiel 38 and 39 being a significant part of that. It's in those days that we live in that the harvest, this end time harvest is coming. So my closing admonition to us, whether you're young, whether you're old, it is so vital that we are forerunners. They, this, this harvest that's going to come in is not going to have a clue. They're going to be so messed up. They've embraced the cultural view of so many things. They are going to be messed up. You, me, this is not just like for the pastor to do. This is for you. This, is, this harvest is going to be so big, so massive, it's going to take an anointed, well-equipped, well-trained forerunner army to reap in this harvest. You've got to be ready. That's why I'm just saying to you, You've got to be ready. You've got to be ready, not just for hard and difficult times. I think sometimes we think getting ready is just like prepping and storing up food and getting, you know, supplies and gas masks or whatever, propane, whatever, prepping. So that's a small part of, I'm not saying we're doing all that, but that's a small part of it. What'd you say? Growing a garden, yeah, we're growing a garden and we have produced one itsy bitty tiny green tomato that's going to save us from the Antichrist. <laughs> yep, so we're going to be able to live on that just like Elijah did on his manna from the ravens. We're going to live on that one itsy bitty tomato for, you know, the next seven to ten years. But the training we need, the equipping we need, it takes time <laughs> Okay, don't waste this time. Listen to what it, let's turn to Psalm 110. See, I told you this point's longer. It's important though, it's very important. Psalm 110. I believe this is an end time prophecy. I won't go into the details of it. But God says, your people will volunteer freely in the day of your power. There is an army that's going to volunteer freely in the day of God's power. What I've been describing in this message, the day of God's power is coming. And there's going to be an army. And it's that the word in the Hebrew actually means they're going to be a free will offering. They're going to sacrifice themselves to say, yes, Lord. I want to be a part of this army, but I just want to say to this right now, however many years we are away from this, I don't know. But I just want to say it takes so much time to be equipped. And don't just discount yourself and say, well, I'm not really a teacher, or I'm not really a, pro a prophet, or I'm not an apostle. Who knows what you are? Maybe you will be if you get equipped. Maybe it's not so much about God sovereignly appointing you from the womb and saying you're a pro prophet to the nations. Maybe it's about you showing a, an interest to want to be equipped and say, God, I want to be equipped for this. And maybe God says, okay, I need an apostle. I need a prophet. I need an evangelist in my end time army. You have trained yourself. Be equipped. But study to show yourself approved. You can't just get this in a podcast or in a blog or on TikTok, okay? You can't just watch a TikTok video of someone dancing and think, okay, I've got it, now I'm equipped. <laughs> it takes years of going deep in this. Now is the time. Now is the time for you to be equipped. Now is the time for you to study to show yourself to pr approved unto God. Don't delay. It's going to come so fast. 
And when it comes, if the church is not prepared for this harvest that's coming in, this thing is, this harvest is going to absolutely break our nets. Listen, I'm saying it to those who have been on this journey, forerunners who have been on this journey for a while, we've got to begin to set into motion the preparation of this army who is going to reap in this great harvest. We've got to be, you know, you've got to be careful about who you unite with, but we've got to join together. It's way too big. This is way too big for one little segment or this little segment to bring in. It is a massive harvest that's going to take all hands on deck, all the army of God trained, all the army of God equipped. We've got to act now. The time is now for us to be prepared, not later. Now. 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 Now, 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 Anna's saying, shut up, that's annoying. Anna, now, Ellie, now, <laughs> now is the time for you to be equipped and trained as a forerunner. See, could you get up and give a teaching and, and share God's eternal plan, God's eternal purpose with people. Could you do that now? If not, you may not be a public speaker, but could you share it with your friends over coffee? Could you share it with your friends over dinner? Could you write it on a blog? Could you put it in a TikTok video and do your dancing and all that stuff? Could you do any of that stuff right now to share that message? Maybe me and Dad will do a TikTok video doing the forerunner message dance. Yeah, I would totally embarrass my daughter, but that might motivate me to do it. <clears throat> God, help us. Get equipped. The army of God needs you for what's coming in the earth. It's massive. It's massive. Amen. Let me pray for us. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Let us be equipped. Let us be trained. Let us be part of this army that's being raised up. Whether our gifts are teaching, prophecy, singing, evangelism, leadership. Lord, I'm just asking you right now that we would be equipped. Lord, let the burden of the Lord... Rest upon us, O oh God. Let us not just look at this prophecy and say, well, that's just too complicated. I don't understand it. Let us, it would much be, might be much better to be equipped and that, that, that timing to be wrong than for that timing to be right and we're not equipped. Because even if you're equipped, God can still use you if the timing is wrong. So, Lord, I pray that you would raise up an army right now in preparation. Lord, I pray you would anoint the forerunners right now who have been prepared for this season and this hour to prepare your church for the hour that's coming very soon into the earth. Lord, I pray that we would be anointed to equip your people. And I pray, God, in this church and those who listen online, Lord, all of us, Lord, all of us would be trained and equipped, we pray. So I'm asking you, Lord, on this day of Pentecost, stir up our spirit. Whether our role is intercession, whether our role is teaching, Lord, stir us up, Lord, we pray. Lord, shake off the slumber of culture that wants to lull us to sleep, that we would be fully awake, on fire, and prepared, we cry out, Lord. Just, Lord, we cry out, break through, we pray. Break through, Lord. Break through, Lord.
Ryan and Abby, I feel like the Lord is saying to you both that you're both called to be part of this end time army. And Ryan, I just feel like for you, God is really going to use you. There's a, there's, a, there's a call of God on your life. You've been set apart by the Lord in this, in this calling. God's called you to be part of this army. And there, there, is, there is a calling of God on you to preach and teach, to speak God's word. And I don't know how that's all going to work out, but I, I just believe... I just believe the Lord's calling is on your life. You've been set apart to be part of this army. The Lord, even, even I just sense, even, even as you're searching, okay, Lord, what is it you're calling me to do? This just came to me. As, as you're searching and asking, okay, Lord, show me what to do. What am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to do? I've graduated and stuff like that. What am I supposed to do? I feel like the Lord is saying that he wants you to think about this ministry calling he has on your life. And... It doesn't mean you like go to seminary. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying that what you do fits into the, this ministry call of God he has on your life is what, is what shapes the other things you do. That, that your, your career needs to be placed into subjection upon the call. And I, I believe that even as you've been praying to the Lord for this, for clarity, I believe the, the Lord is saying that your, your, your career must be in subjection to your call. And I, I believe that's even some of the things you've been praying for, Lord, because show me, give me clarity about this. I think the Lord really wants to, to make that shift in your mentality. The, the call is above, the call of God on my life. And you may not even fully, like, you may not even really want that right now. I think you do. But I believe God is going to anoint you. God is really going to anoint you. You've got the call of God on your life for this. And, and just... Uh, just really believe that. So just want to encourage you in that, that, that to, study, uh, to study to show yourself approved. Even, uh, even you and Quentin, I just want to encourage you and Quentin, I'm not sure if Quentin is still here, but you and Quentin to begin to be iron sharpening iron because Quentin has the same call of God on his life also. Just that you too would be iron that sharpens iron to, to, to make sure you're taking this time you have to really, really get equipped. Just like you were equipped in football and you, 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 know, you disciplined and trained and stuff like that. That same type of discipline as it comes to studying the word and going deep in the Lord, I believe God's going to give that to you. And as you begin to step into that calling, I believe doors are going to open even for your career. That, that, that your calling and your career, God's going to marry together and show you how those two things work. Even like he's done with me, my calling and my career go hand in hand. Even like Paul, where he made tents, uh, that his tent making was part of his call. And I, I believe... That the Lord wants to make a shift in how you're thinking. It's not about my career. It's not about my career. It's about my calling and my career working together to fulfill what God has set you apart to do. Amen. So thank you, Lord. Just, just thank you for the spirit of prophecy, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Father, just stir up, stir up, Lord. Thank you. Let us be stirred, Lord. Evan and Ben, you guys back there? Okay, stand up just real quick. Let me pray for you guys. I've had this word over you guys before, but I feel it stirred again that, that God has called you two to do ministry together. Ben, you're called to lead worship. Evan, you're called to, to preach. So you want to stop the word now. I think you know you're called to preach, but it'll, it'll unfold in God's timing. So... But I, I, just, I just sense for the two of you that, that you're meant to be a team and that uh, you're meant to be a team and you're not meant to just wait till you're old like our age to start. I believe God's going to anoint you even in your youth. And it's, uh, it, it's very important that you just, just receive this and even to step out in faith in it. Sometimes, you know, I'm not saying you're like, you know, you're, you're going to be in full-time ministry either, but, but I believe both of you have a ministry calling together and, and just, I just want to encourage you to really step out in faith in this, okay? And, and just take what I'm saying and ask the Lord, okay? And why don't you two, listen, Evan and Ben, why don't you two spend some time together and pray about this together and say, okay, Lord, show us what you want us to do. And you two wait on the Lord together and show us, okay, is what I'm saying even true? If, it's, if you're like, that's just from what you ate last night, then disregard it. But if you feel like, okay, this is the Lord, 
I sense the Lord in this. I want to encourage you to, to pray together and say, Lord, um, show us what we're to do. Show us what we're to do. How are we to, what steps are, you, are we to take? And so if you get any ideas and you want to run them by me or whatever, by all means do. But I just believe, I just believe God wants you to, to begin to take a step of faith and act on that, act on that, act on that. Even Ben, where you're getting ready for college, I think the Lord wants you also to be, to be mindful of your calling to lead worship also in those decisions as well, just like I was saying to Ryan. Yes, thank you, Lord. Lord, I pray for Evan and Ben. I just pray, Father, that you would release upon them the spirit of prophecy. Just someone, Michael, why don't you and Jeanette just lay your hands on them. Lord, I just pray right now, Lord, that, that you would release upon Ben and Evan, Lord, the spirit of prophecy. Lord, release upon them the spirit of prophecy. I just ask you, Lord, release upon them the spirit of prophecy, the testimony of Jesus Christ, which is the spirit of prophecy. Stir up in them, Lord, the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Lord, baptize them afresh in the Holy Spirit's power with the spirit of prophecy, Lord, to proclaim your word in the, in the day and hour which they are being trained and equipped for. Evan, there is, Evan and Ben, there is a forerunner calling on both of you. Both of you have a forerunner calling, and as you come together as a team, it is going to be expressed in a very beautiful way that there is that, that anointing on your lives that must go hand in hand. That is just a, a team, there's a team thing, a team, team dynamic there in this forerunner calling that God has anointed you both, that you're going to complement one another. And it's a forerunner calling. So, Lord, just anoint them in that forerunner calling, Lord. Set them apart even in this day, even in their youth, even in their young age. Set them apart, Lord, in this calling, I pray, in the name of Jesus, Lord. In the name of Jesus, Lord. In the name of Jesus, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. Just do it. Do it. Do it, Lord. Do it, Lord. Do it, Lord. Dad, if you have anything to share, come on up. By the way, um, you know, you're talking about me being the old man, which I feel that way a lot. But uh, oh, Terry there. Bennett did prophesy over me that I would live to see the fulfillment of what I've lived for. Amen. So I'm, oh, I'm uh, amen. claiming that. Yeah, amen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I was well, kidding, by the way. Oh, yeah. I know you yeah. were. I know you were, yeah. And by the way, I think the Lord is judging your tomatoes because of the way you've judged my garden. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to say too much because yeah. uh, I, I, don't want my, I don't want to pride destroy my own garden, you know. But no, it's, it's right yeah, we're gonna have, we're gonna have to have some help. You got, yeah, to you got that tribulation. tomato. <laughs> that one tomato you got is gonna go a long, long way. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. it's yeah. gonna sustain us. Um, what, what I was getting, I'd actually gotten some of this earlier in the week, and I just wanted to get it out there. We, of course, we'd have to pray about it. Uh, but when you were saying uh, to everybody that. Uh, are you able to communicate the forerunner message to people, you know, whether it's one-on-one -on -one or what, whatever? Uh, this week, the Lord had given, I, th I think it was the Lord given it to me, but I thought, okay, if we do this, nobody would really come probably. But anyway, I was thinking what I was sensing again, it came back to me today after, that, after you said that. I sensed that I, as a church, we're supposed to host a something along the line of a new wineskin church or something like that uh, where we take the various, you know, five or six of the components of the forerunner message and, and consolidate those into an hour teaching each or something with the weekend, we communicate the forerunner message in four to six hours of teaching yeah. So that, you know, because sometimes you can get lost in the trees, you know, you don't see the forest for the trees. Uh, and I think for us, but then it would be an opportunity for us to invite 
you know, people that might be open to hearing that message yeah. as yeah. well. So anyway, Absolutely. something to pray about. But I really do sense if, I sense it would be very, very helpful. That, that yeah. part is not a question whether we could, whether people would participate and, and, and would others come as well would be the question yeah. on it. But anyway, I wanted to get it out there because I really do sense that could be very, very helpful. Amen. Yeah. So. That would mean Ben and Evan have to come on the front row. Well, actually, we go, I would say maybe next week we ought to get yeah. Yeah. Evan to preach and Ben to lead worship. Oh, or? yeah. I like it. I like it. <laughs> Step out in faith. No, not, not next weekend. Maybe... Yeah. Sunday no, I think, I think absolutely. I think the Lord just has stirred that for sure, that we've got to get equipped as a forerunner uh, church, not just to hear it, but to, there's a huge difference between hearing a message and then having to communicate that. Um, vast difference there. So, yeah. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Okay, well, just in closing here, before we go offline, just uh, we are taking up an offering for Shmuel Birnbaum, a pastor in Tel Aviv, Israel, or right outside Tel Aviv in Bat Yam. And uh, Shmuel is trying to purchase a van. And I, I, I think we've raised, what's the number, Adam? So we're about seven, we're right now about $7,000. What God put into my heart was us to raise $10,000. And I just want to encourage you, whether you're in person or online, I just want to encourage you to, to give to this, to just to bless Shmuel, uh, Shmuel in this, to help him get a van. I, I really do believe, you know, me and Angie were praying about it. She had a number. I had a higher number. Um, I felt like the Lord is really wanting to, to even challenge us in our giving some to, to see, okay, if you step out and you even make, you know, again, you got to hear the Lord from this. Just don't just hear it from me. I'm not, don't be, you know, take this some manipulation. But pray about it. And, and if the Lord has challenged you to give something, you're like, God, that's a lot of money. That's, we don't really have that. I believe the Lord wants to really, really train us here to show us that, that when we bless Israel, God blesses us. And we're not doing it selfishly, but we're doing it in response to what I believe the Lord is saying, if you bless Israel, God will bless you. And, and, and doing it in such a way that when you sow into Israel, God then blesses you. I think he wants to establish that truth within our hearts. So just want to encourage you to give online, uh, restorationlife.org, or give in person. Um, and so just want to encourage you to do that. And then the other announcement is we are not having our Zoom prayer time that was scheduled for tonight at six. We're not having that since we prayed for Israel uh, just in the worship time. So we're not having that. So anyway, God bless you. Thank you for joining us online. And uh, then in person.